So Rick, why don't we get started? Let's talk a little bit about pain points. Like what exactly are, you know, in general, like what is the, what is the status quo and what, what are customers feeling and how does VMware Cloud Foundation answer those? You know, certainly as, as we've gone through this, right. And when you start talking with customers that are in the, in the middle or just planning these big transformation projects, the focus usually goes around technology, right? And technology is obviously an enabler to be able to pull all this together. And at the end of the day, what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out how to be able to grow the inter enterprise, how to be able to drive more innovation and leverage your infrastructure really as a tool to be able to help drive that innovation. But the part that people tend to overlook is really around people and processes, right? If I just focus on the technology itself, but I overlook the technology, the people and the processes, the technology isn't going to be able to help me. And so as part of this, a lot of folks has really have really looked at, all right, do I try to drive net new consumption uh, leveraging my existing infrastructure, right? So they'll try to bring in three-tier, you know, legacy infrastructure into these big transformation projects. And the problem is, is that they bring in a lot of tech debt with it. And, and it does typically slow a lot of these programs down. And so what, what happens, right? People basically use public cloud as the easy button, right? They go in, they say, look, I'm just going to go ahead and you know sweep the floor. I'm going to migrate applications. I'm going to refactor these applications. And then, you know, eight months later, they're ready to go. But even for those customers, and, and is, you know, if I kind of build this out here a little bit, even for those customers that have made that transition, the dilemma is, do I refresh my existing platforms or I just go all in on cloud? The challenge with cloud is really that cost management. And we've heard this from a number of CIOs we've talked to in terms of a lot of them just can't control that cost, right? The cost gets out of hand very, very quickly. As a matter of fact, there was an IDC study last year that showed essentially 64% of CIOs said that they are overspending on their already high cloud budgets. So the ability to be able to manage that you know, is, is very difficult. And when you factor on top of that, that when you look at things like reserved instances and the ability to be able to essentially have some dedicated performance guarantees within it, a lot of times you end up wasting resources, right? So, you know, again, same study showed that 33 to 35% of that cloud spend is going towards wasted cycles, cycles that I'm actually not using as part of it. Yeah. And so, you know, obviously for certain use cases, public cloud makes a lot of sense, but the refactoring of applications and really the ability or the inability to be able to manage that cloud cost does be, you know, start to become a real pain point as I go through it. But then if you look at the alternative, right, if, if I just try to take my legacy three tier infrastructure and try to bring it into this transformation framework, uh, I, I find a couple of things. First off, that it, it's very difficult to be able to do that and also to be able to address some of the things we talked about before. Right. How do I bring in my people and my processes as part of this transformation? And, you know, if you look at it, uh, there's a study actually last year that showed 60 to 80 percent of my IT spend typically goes to just keeping the light on. Right. Yeah. Just keeping yeah. that legacy infrastructure up to date, patched and make sure that all my security vulnerabilities are taken care of. But when I'm operating in a siloed environment, I have to do this across compute, storage, networking, and to be able to make sure that my security team is in line with that. So it becomes very, very difficult to be able to keep all of those systems in line. And, and you know what we know, right? And, and this number keeps going up. The average cost of a data breach is now over $4 million. And that's average, right? So you're going to have customers that are going to be a lot higher on that scale and customers that are a lot, a lot lower on the scale. And so when looking at this, you really need to look at the architectures that make sense as you're trying to deploy these net new deployments and trying to get in as part of these larger digital transformation programs. Yeah, I mean, you, you were talking about cost. Obviously, the cost of security breaches is astronomical, but just in general, like the cost of cloud in general, the smaller you are, sure, you know, the larger you get, the, the, the cost of cloud can certainly become astronomical. You know, it's like... Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, it's kind of like my trips to, to Europe, you know, I say, oh, well, there's airfare is this much and hotel is this. I'm only going to spend X dollars. And then by the time I get home, I'm like, wow, I'm way over budget. Right. <laughs> you know, exactly. it's, it's definitely a common issue for sure. Exactly. Exactly. And so as we look at this, right, is that, OK, so what are my options? Right. What can I do? 
uh, as I go forward with this. And, and at the end of the day, architecture matters, right? And so if you look at these traditional siloed architectures, right, where I've got my compute, my server team, I've got my, my storage team, I've got my networking team, these siloed architectures really do bring forward a lot of essentially poor efficiencies in terms of how I leverage that. So as a result, I'm not getting full utilization of this. And the fact that I'm running on proprietary hardware really gives me a lot of difficulty in terms of how I can grow and scale these, as well as provide the flexibility and agility, right? If, if I want to be able to drive a, a DevOps program and leverage it on this you know, existing infrastructure, I have to use APIs, right? And a lot of times I have to customize these APIs or write custom scripts as a way to be able to provide automation and orchestration in these environments. And so if you look at the flip side of that, right? If I take a page from the hyperscaler playbook, right? Where I essentially use really much more of a platform architecture where I have a well-defined infrastructure layer that's bringing together compute, networking, storage, and security in that infrastructure layer. Now I've taken that first step. And you know, you think about it as like, okay, how did AWS and Azure and, and GCP, how did they build their infrastructure? Did they go off and buy storage arrays and traditional networking gear? Hell no. They, what they did is they actually started with standard off-the-shelf hardware, right? So they took commodity x86 hardware and used that hardware as a way to be able to build out, scale out infrastructure. And it's really putting the value in software. So if you look at all of the services, all the capabilities that are available in these hyperscale cloud networks, it's really the ability to be able to leverage that software-defined infrastructure as a way to go forward. And so if you look at how you know, bringing these kind of technology um, processes, bringing these on-prem, it does provide now the ability to essentially break down some of the silos that exist and allowing now these teams to work together in much more of a platform architecture mode. mode. And, and, you know, Gartner Data backs this up, right? In, in their predicts 2024 uh, research that they put out this year, they said more than 50% of companies that are still using traditional architectures, as I show on the left, are moving towards this platform architecture approach. Now, it's going to be a combination of doing this on-prem and building out, you know, software-defined data center type infrastructure, as well as using cloud-based infrastructure. But as we said in the beginning, you got to make sure that you're bringing your people and your processes in as part of this. Otherwise, what you're going to do is you're going to start to bring in a lot of technical debt. And with that technical debt starts to bring a lot of complexity and complexity, as we know, is the enemy of execution. If I'm trying to execute one of these big, you know, bold programs, I need the ability to be able to remove a lot of the obstacles that are typically going to get in the way to be able to do that. And so at the infrastructure layer, that's one that's the first place that they typically attack this, where I'm essentially taking the same approach x86 hardware, software-defined infrastructure, and putting all the value across storage, network, compute, and security, I'm putting that all in software. But then you have to be able to figure out, okay, now how do I orchestrate this so this works in unison, works as one single system? And so that orchestration layer, and again, very much following the same lines of, as how the hyperscalers have built it out, is really the ability to be able to build out this leveraged infrastructure in a way that now I can automate a lot of these capabilities, automate it in the way that I, now I can essentially start to become hands off, right? The admins don't have to go in and, and essentially turn the knobs as a way to do this. They're essentially just turning this infrastructure up. Now, once I do that, I can start to deploy infrastructure at scale to be able to service these types of opportunities. Again, same model. If I bring my DevOps team now, my DevOps team now has the ability to go through this kind of IaaS layer, right? Where I'm taking all of these abstracted uh, components of infrastructure and now bringing it up into much more of a services construct, right? Now I'm, I'm actually operating as a services construct where now if I'm a developer, I go in, I use my APIs, I use my uh, declarative syntax and, and YAML code as a way to build infrastructure as code. Once you have that in place, now you're really following that, that model that allows you to be able to deploy these services at scale and allow your developers to be so much more productive in terms of how we do this.
Yeah, I mean, this has been a story, you know, this has been a very, you know, it's like a recurring story at VMware yeah. over the years. It's like, you know, taking away the complexity, abstracting the complexity, like application owners don't really care what types of hard drives we're using, whether what are their speeds and feeds. They need a place to put their app. They need a certain amount of storage, you know. And so the idea of, you know, abstracting that complexity. But I love that it's evolved to a place where we're talking about compute, networking, storage and management and just literally raising it up. So it's like. Developers can provision storage, you know, in their own language, uh, you know, administrators can provision, you know, environments for customer for their for their customers, their internal customers. It just makes perfect sense. It's it's a really it's a story that you could almost have uh, predict the future if you would have been watching VMware over the years. Like it just makes sense that this was going to be where we where we've come to. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And and again, as, as you start to you know scale this out and start to do this not only within the data center, but now you start to look at, okay, how can I extend these services out into my edge? How can I extend these services out into my partner clouds or my hyperscale clouds? The ability to have that consistent infrastructure layer on-prem across all these cloud uh, endpoints now gives me the power to be able to say, look, services I build on-prem or I build within data center one, I can now take those same services because of the fact that I've got that consistent infrastructure layer and a consistent operating model. I can now st start to deploy this at scale on prem at the edge or out in the cloud services. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know how he pronounces this. I'm going to totally butcher it, but I just added a comment on there. Yeah. I uh, do. says, I love the fact that you're able to, to address each, se each section of development, looking at the architecture and developer. Absolutely. Well, it's important, right? Because you have to be able to, I mean, obviously the primary audience is the infrastructure team, but the infrastructure team, you have to understand who are their customers, right? And, and so to the point that was just made, you have to make sure that the developers, you have to make sure the platform teams are all bought into this because of the fact that that's how, again, you start to bring the people and processes into it. Once you start to do that, you can do that at scale. Now it gives you the ability to have a very repeatable model. And again, this is a page right out of the hyperscaler playbook. We didn't invent this. We're really now taking this and that actually applying this into on-prem data centers that have the ability to be able to extend that cloud operating model out to the edge or into cloud. I like it. Cool, 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 cool. And, and so what does this mean, right? In, in terms of what VMware offers and, and certainly, you know, with a lot of the changes that have been well publicized, you know, once we've closed the Broadcom acquisition, what does this mean now in terms of the ability to be able to scale this out? And, and what are our offers and how the offers map to this, right? So if you look at that same platform model that I just talked about, it is the ability to be able to build out my compute storage and networking layer. I've got that infrastructure layer, but this is now all fully integrated. And then underneath of a a uh, common automation and operations framework. And now what that framework does is it gives you the ability to be able to take essentially the abstracted resources from an infrastructure side and now start to deliver those as services up to that IaaS consumption surface. This consumption surface, this is where the developers live, right? They go in, they log in, they get their own namespace. But within the namespace, now they actually have a set of resources that they can now start to use and deploy into their specific sprints. So now they can actually start to self-serve in these environments so to build their own environments. They can run through their sprint. When they're done with the sprint, they destroy the cluster. Those resources now go back in the pool so somebody else can use it. So it really is this model of kind of this flexible, fungible model that allows me the ability to leverage a defined set of infrastructure resources, but now I can apply it out to a number of different workloads. And this is highly extensible, right? I can use this for traditional uh, client server, Oracle, SQL, non you know, no SQL based um, type applications that are running my back office. So I can run this in my traditional back office mission critical apps I'm running today. I can extend this now into containers because of the fact we've embedded a uh, Kubernetes runtime within the environment. I now actually have a full runtime that I can actually use as a way to orchestrate containers within this broad-based environment. But you know, obviously the big thing, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, the big thing is the ability now to start to push into some of the higher performance, low latency 
uh, workloads, you know, such as AI and, and machine yeah. learning certainly been part of the portfolio for some time, but those have always been more predictive AI models. What we're doing now is now starting to push into these generative AI models, where now you have the ability to essentially have these machines start to think and start to learn from what's building out there and be much more responsive as part of it. Obviously, much larger data sets, but the common platform approach where I can build a platform, have that platform essentially be customized to be able to fit within these environments, now extends that out from you know, your kind of common back office applications, modern applications using containers and Kubernetes as an orchestration framework, and then now applying those constructs into a AI and Gen AI, this is really going to open up. And, and obviously, you know, with GTC coming up in a couple of weeks, you're going to start to see a lot more announcements and rollouts of net new products that are supporting these capabilities. Yeah, and I see private AI up there, uh, just yep. above the blue box on the right there. I see some other add-ons. So these are the these are the new add-ons for VMware Cloud Foundation that I've heard about. Exactly. So it's the ability to be able to essentially take the core platform, which you know, which we kind of show as VCF in the middle there, that kind of the big blue box in the middle. Um, take the, the core platform, but now how can I extend it into a number of different use cases, right? So I, I talk about security and load balancing as one of the use cases. Now I can start to bring in through the application network security team, I can now start to bring in advanced services that allow me the ability to use AI as a way to be able to determine anomalies within the system, whitelist or blacklist any uh, resources or workloads that may be affected by that uh, so that I can quarantine those workloads, take corrective action. And then if indeed it is an issue, I've isolated that issue there. So security starts to become, it's obviously a conversation that's top of mind for a lot of our customers, but it now it starts to become a competitive differentiator as you look at blowing this out across there. Um, on the other side, the ability to be able to have these Tanzu services. Now I can take that Tanzu service that's embedded within the platform, but now I want to be able to bring a orchestration and observability capability. And those are some of the management uh, uh, tools that are available through that advanced Tanzu service that are offered there. And I know you have this in, in one of your upcoming um, sessions, Pete, but Ransomware disaster recovery, this is so, so important. We're hearing this come from small companies all the way up to your largest enterprises. Everyone's concerned about not only how do I prevent a ransomware from you know, coming in, a malware coming into my system and, and creating a, a ransomware event, but if indeed that happens and the unlikely event it happens, how do I recover from it, right? How do I make sure that my systems are protected and I can recover those quickly? And then, you know, last but not least, and this, this will be a, a focus, you know, certainly as GTC comes out in the next couple of weeks, the ability to be able to run these private AI services where now rather than putting my intellectual property up oh, yeah. in the public domain, running it out in cloud services, I can now start to run these in a secure environment where, you know, my CIO knows that the only people that are going to have access to this information are the people that I trust, the people that I, that I give that capability. And, and there's an entire ecosystem and it's, it's actually a much deeper conversation. But this is something we've been, you know, we announced last year at VMware Explorer, you know, initially with, with NVIDIA, but then expanded it into relationships that we have with Intel and IBM. And essentially what we're doing, Pete, is we're building out a complete ecosystem using VCF as that core platform to be able to deploy these services at scale, both for customers that are essentially providing their own um, you know, service providers. So essentially they are becoming their own cloud provider on-prem, but then also working through our provider managed services. These are our CSPs, those that are deploying sovereign cloud for secure environments. And then obviously the relationships we have with our hyperscalers, providing the ability to take this common infrastructure model and, and deploying this out across different uh, cloud endpoints at scale. 